Reconsider Christ podcast provides real life examples on how Christ works to interact with our lives. Our guests paint on the canvas of life, their stories of joy, heartache, struggle, and victory. You will learn more about the true nature of Christ, for it is time to reconsider Christ. Today, we discuss how to find spiritual, mental, and emotional healing with a unique blend of Christ's teachings and behavior design. Junie Felix walks us through a chaotic and abusive childhood, which resulted in complex trauma to help us understand how to achieve healing. Junie teaches others how to move away from the controlling power of trauma to healing. Her book, You Are Worth the Work, Moving Forward from Trauma to Faith, compiles her discoveries for the benefit of complex trauma survivors and others who want to move away from what controls them. Let's listen in as Junie walks us through her childhood and the important people Christ placed in front of her. Good morning, Junie. Good morning, Jean. It's wonderful to see you. Oh, I just have been anticipating our conversation. I love every time we get together to talk. And the more and more I just reflect on your life and your story and the trajectory of where you're going from here, your kindness of heart, your humility of spirit is just beautiful. And I just want everybody to see it. Thank you for your time today. Oh, my pleasure. My honor. And thank you. I'm, I'm just a big goofball doing this thing called life. And I, I just love these invitations that God gives for us to get together and talk about how great he is. Well, goofballs is a biblical term. Paul <laughs> used the Greek word cracked pots which yeah. translates in the goofballs. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> I just made that up, but it sounds good. <laughs> it sounds good, Pastor. You did good. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different things today, but one of the key takeaways is going to be how do you handle severe and significant trauma in your life and overcome it? And you, uh, in your studies and, and your life walk has brought you to a point where you're very informed on this and have some unique concepts and systems that I think are going to, to bless people's lives. But let's start uh, at the beginning in early childhood. Uh, life was not um, as, as we would want it to be for a, for a toddler. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I was literally born into a whirlwind of chaos and drama and trauma, uh, abuse, homelessness, hunger, you name it. Um, unfortunately, it is a part of my journey. It's a part of my story here on this side of glory. And so my growing years were just the best way I can describe them were, were chaotic and heartbreaking, confusing. Uh, just a lot of things to be afraid of, you know, when you're just a little human being born on this big planet Earth. I am a complex trauma survivor, um, even adding to that, that's a term that means that I'm an individual with multiple layers of trauma, um, mostly beginning in the formative years, and there's plenty of research on complex trauma, but I'm a complex trauma survival and a pre-verbal trauma survivor, and that's a term to describe those of us who were um, experienced traumatic uh, events before we had words to speak. Um, for example, I have second degree burns on my body from when I was six months old. And I started trauma therapy at about age four, according to my medical records. I'm a researcher. So this is something that I, I needed to find out because I needed answers in the journey. When you're dealing with so much pain and this echo of that trauma, this heartache that you wake up with literally every day, Jean, and you're trying to understand it, as a researcher, I did everything I could to learn about this journey and also to later on when I met the Lord, reconcile the reality of deeply personal evil that you cannot help but take personally, reconcile the reality of evil and the goodness of God. So a lot of my growing years were just a lot of things that I wish I didn't have memory of, but do because of the trauma gene. I think about my one-year-old granddaughter and uh, the love and experience she has. And just, uh, just when I hold her, you know, the vulnerability of her life. And I think about the experiences like you have had, which uh, is more common than we want to think and realize. And, and because it is in those formative years, it, uh, it takes a massive effort to, to overcome. So well said. Yes, it is a lot of work. 
And unfortunately, many people who come out of complex trauma and these traumatic experiences, they don't understand that they have worth and that they're worth the work. And so that's one of the hardest things is just accepting that it's unfair, but you're worth the work and it is hard work. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing about watching the steps in your life is, is that key concept. People at an early age, before you could even really cry out for it and ask for it, started showing you that you were a person of worth. And so, you know, you're four years old and this, uh, tell me about how all of a sudden you're in trauma training. You really don't remember much of it, but at least it gets you in this, in the cycle of, of counseling and, and, and help. But that was a critical point. Who was that? How did that happen? <laughs> well, um, I'm probably, it's probably, I don't know exactly how it happened, of course, because I was so young, but um, I'm read, my medical records, review, I can't really read the handwriting because I love doctors. I have two sisters that are doctors, but your handwriting, I can't, I don't know the doctor because I did want to find this person and thank them. But it's just those, those acts of kindness along the way that when you meet the Lord later on and you realize that he is the source of that, of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, you know, all of it, kindness is in there. And I have it right here behind me all the yes, time. Because the kindness of God is what leads us to repentance. And so when you trace the journey back and you think about someone who noticed um, a, a, a toddler, a child who was having such a hard time, I, I can remember my trauma sessions from as early as age nine. I do have vivid memories of those sessions. And that was because, again, someone who was kind, who took the, the time to notice a little girl who sits in the back of the classroom crying every day could use a little help. And so for those of you who are guidance counselors and teachers and physicians, healthcare professionals who notice I'm living proof that it really, really matters. And those are things that you just don't forget. And it also gave me a very early appreciation for, for mental health and for the help, the resources that God has provided through the professional resources. And of course, ideally, soul care is the chief task of the church. And so we as brothers and sisters in faith in community and those who are in positions of leadership with the right training can really help be someone who's a catalyst for healing in someone's life like mine that can get them to the help that they need. So yeah, just the journey has been long and hard, but now that I look back, I'm thankful for so many things, more thankful than anything, but not thankful for my trauma, Gene. Right. Let's, you know, be, let's be clear. <laughs> yes. Yes. I remember when I, I wasn't raised in the church, but I remember being, um, I was assimilated into church culture in my early twenties. Um, mm. And I remember hearing a message from a guy who traveled to our to put on a presentation and he, he fell into a burning pit of tar when he was in the military and he was burned all over. And I remember him saying, I'm thankful for this because God taught me blah, blah, blah. And I thought that's so strange to be thankful for horrible things. So no, I'm not thankful for my trauma. I'm thankful for the goodness of God, but it's just a part of my journey. And now I'm so happy to be able to help others to find hope and to know our God for who he is. He doesn't need to orchestrate this evil to bring about good because, you know, he's the source. Unfortunately, your life at four, year old, four years old did not drastically change and there continued to be chaos and upheaval and, uh, you know, trauma. And now you're nine years old, you're in a homeless shelter and mm -hmm. another person shows up. Now, it probably took quite a few years. Before, I know it took quite a few years before you appreciated this person, but uh, tell, yeah. me about, tell me about this person who shows up in the homeless shelter. Well, there was a woman who would come and make donuts. And I'll, I'll never forget that because I, I'm just fascinated by cooking because I don't cook. It's just like a superpower. But uh -huh. I remember the, the woman who made donuts and she would read us these Bible stories um, from, uh, with pictures about Jesus. Donuts and, in the Bible. That's right. <laughs> and so there was one day where she looked up from the from the, the Bible book and she looked so serious and so kind. And she said, Judy, don't you know your life is a gift from God? And I was a sassy little thing. And so my immediate response was, well, did God keep the receipt? Because, yeah, it had just been chaos and heartache. And um, my, for, for example, my mother was sick as long as I knew her. She had multiple uh, diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses and other problems along the way, but I never knew my mother well. And um, I spent 
my most of my life on suicide watch my entire childhood and most of my adulthood she passed in 2015 um but um yeah when you are dealing with that kind of heartache and confusion it is it's hard to um it's easy to lose hope and yeah so she said your life is a gift and i asked did you keep the receipt but that wasn't the only important thing that happened that year, because that was the year, praise Jesus. My mom, she did manage to keep us in school, uh, even though we moved more time, more times than I could ever count. People mm-hmm. ask me, I hate that question, where are you from? Because it's like everywhere. <laughs> but um, she did keep us in school. And that was the year when I was nine years old that I first sat in front of that Apple IIe computer. Jane, do you remember those? Yes, I thought it was the greatest thing ever made. (laughs) Right? The Apple IIe computer. And I I put in that floppy disk and I loaded up my wagon to conquer the quest of the Oregon Trail. Two meg floppy disk. (laughs) Yes, that's right. I loaded up that wagon to conquer the the Oregon Trail. And that was when nine years old was when I realized that I've got to figure out how this works. And that's when I fell in love with coding and programming, systems design, and really the more I learned, the more I saw the parallels between the way that the same technology that powers our technology also helps us to understand our own minds. It's actually one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes. He says, every, every child should take computer programming because it teaches you, this was in the lost interview, but mm-hmm. it teaches you how your mind works. And it's more of an art than a science. And I believe that to be true. Mm-hmm. A key moment in your life when you made that connection is we'll see where you're spending a lot of time in your adult years. Uh, and so that really clicked. So again, people are entering your life. You're beginning to understand your interest and how you're put together uniquely to do the things that uh, you were meant to do. And, you know, upheaval, chaos continues. And now you're in Germany because you're part of, you know, military situation. You're 12 years old and you're at the cow. How did you get to the cow and what impact did that moment have? (laughs) Well, (laughs) <laughs> All right. So my, my mama, she, I, I, she was trying to figure out the best ways, I guess, to take care of us. And so she kind of disappeared for a few months. She dropped us off at my adopted grandfather's house and she didn't come back uh, but for, for a long time. When she did finally came back, she came back with this guy uh, who turned out eventually to, well, not too much far eventually, who became my stepfather and he was in the army. And so we moved to Germany. And there I was, you know, age 12 and some, somebody got a bright idea to pack a school bus full of 12 and 13 year olds and drive us to one of the largest remaining death camps, uh, which was Dachau. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I can vividly remember, um, even have to hold back tears as I share this with Eugene, walking those gravel roads and uh, seeing the bunks, the so-called bunks, seeing the gas chambers and the incinerating ovens and that was the first time in my life that I felt the tangible presence of evil. There was evil living in that place. And they took us to a little chapel on site, what was left of a makeshift chapel that the survivors would go to and call out to God for help. And I, you know, I didn't know this God, um, but it just so impacted me that I remember as a 12, 12 year old, 12 and a half year old, making a a promise, a vow even, and I hesitate to use that word because Jesus said, don't make vows, but I made a promise. I didn't know who I was talking to or if anybody listened to or anybody cared that there's enough evil, there's enough abuse, there's enough hunger, want, need, hopelessness, there's enough evil. I will be a part of what's good in this world. I had no idea what that meant, but it was a promise that I made at a young age that really made quite a difference in the years to come. Absolutely. And, and, uh, strength of spirit to see that and to say that at that time uh and again as you look back you just see you know the building up of juni felix and you know how you continue to grow uh it's just amazing to see so homeless person traveling the world (laughs) touring germany uh you know learning such a valuable lesson there Uh, dealing with all the dynamics at home, you know, continuing to shift. And then you're in high school. And obviously, you have to go to work to help support your siblings. So you're going to school half a day, you're going to work. And the next pivotal point comes, you know, in 11th grade. So talk to us about that. Yeah. So 
I started working when I was about um, 14, when we were living in Germany. So I started paying bills at a very young age. I remember one of my goals at age 14 was to earn enough money to be able to have our van shipped back to the States. So that's the kind of stuff I was thinking about in the eighth grade. Yeah. So here we are back in the States. And um, I, we moved up. Uh, I think three more times after we got back to the States. So I'm in another, I'm at another high school now for the 11th grade. And I was working half the day. I went to class and then at lunchtime, I took a bus to a job. I was a data entry a clerk at an insurance company in the 11th grade and I carpooled. And there was a very kind woman, Miss Linda Jarvis. And she, I, I remember her name. I remember the smell of her perfume. And she said to me one day on the way back from the insurance company, she said, Rooney, I have something for you. I know you like to read. And she hands me this book, you know, and it's a Bible. And I remember the cover of the book. It was an NIV study Bible for teens. And I even remember the picture on the cover. There were these teens trying to look cool, but they were all reading this Bible. And I was like, thank you. I do love to read. And she said, I know you love to read. And and this is a book that might help you to understand the truth about what you're worth. Uh. Those are her exact words. And at the time, I, I was thankful for her kindness, and I do love to read. I, I didn't believe I had any worth. I believe I, I had absolutely no worth apart from my usefulness to whoever needed me to be useful for them. And so I took the Bible home, and Ian, I started reading it, and I could not stop. I read like nonstop at every opportunity for as long as I can think of or remember, because in the pages of that book, I met the kindest, most loving, most compassionate, most beautiful human being who ever walked the earth. And that was Jesus Christ. Yeah. It was quite a realization because I have, when I was five years old and we were living in Italy, um, <laughs> I found this stuffed raccoon in the hospital. My mother was pregnant with my sister, Mariko. And there was in the waiting room, this beautiful little soft stuffed raccoon in the waiting room. And I knew it was for me. I don't know how I knew it was for me. I'm five years old, but I, I adopted that little stuffed raccoon. And his name is Radar because when you're in the military, there's one channel, it's called AFN Arms Forces Network. And there was always this show on, which I now know to be MASH. And there was a character in the show named Radar. Right. So I named this raccoon Radar because they both start with R. So I kept, I still have Radar the raccoon. Radar is at my bedside in the other room uh, in my home office. Yeah. Um, Radar is um, X number of years old now. <laughs> <laughs> X, X number of years. <laughs> I still have Radar because I would hold him and talk to him and he seemed to always respond. And he always responded in a kind and loving way. Um, compassionate and loving and wise this little raccoon was my whole growing years but in the scriptures I started recognizing a very familiar voice and I remember looking up from the gospels I was in the gospel of, of Matthew I remember looking up and saying out loud oh it's you and in that moment I realized that's when I changed the promise that I made when I was 12 and a half at the concentration camp I said, I will be a part of the good in this world by living and loving like Jesus. Man, what a transition. And, you know, Junie, I've heard that story often from children who were in difficult situations and they didn't realize it at the time until later that it was Jesus working in their life, you know, drawing them towards him, protecting them at critical moments. Uh, it's just amazing, you know, so, so many, I'm sorry, I'm going to get on my soapbox, but so many people feel like, you know, Jesus and God are way out there and, you know, disconnected, but when you can open your eyes and have a little sense of spiritualness, you begin to realize how active he is and yes. how he desires you, you know, and, and wants you as his, uh, so that's just, it's fascinating to hear it again, so encouraging. To oh. hear it again. So oh, I, another, I, yeah, another critical moment. It. Yeah. So, so let me ask this question. You, you and Radar have a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> to this day. <laughs> to this day. <laughs> and 
then you realize that Christ was using that toy to, to interact with you. And then you begin to understand the person of Jesus. So describe your relationship with him at that moment. Oh my goodness, I just believe. And I know that's a simple statement. I just believe. And to this day, I still believe. And I was uh, texting with a friend because I love kids. I was teaching at a, um, in 2020, a pandemic shut all this down, but I was teaching at a Codeverse, a startup on a mission to teach a billion, teach a billion kids to code. And I just love kids. I love spending time with kids. Um, I don't want to have any more kids. I like other people's kids. So I was out just three days ago building a huge, like, snow palace with my friend who's a pastor his kids and his his wife texted me just last night and she said they love this thing never built anything like it they're playing it all day I have to bring them in they're freezing um because it's like 19 degrees outside right but um I just God says to enter the kingdom of heaven we must become his little children and one of the things that she texted me is oh the wonder and joy of childhood and I responded to that text message last night that is a promise that I made to myself. I would never forget wonder and the joy of childhood, which is why we have a good snow and I will head out and play with whatever kids want to play. I take my kiddo with me. My, my, my son goes with me. But the wonder and joy of childhood and the power of belief, the simplicity of belief. My relationship with Jesus continued through his word. I always, now I know I'd always heard from him. He always gave me the sense of his presence. He was with me. It was, you know, radar at first, but then through the word and the Holy Spirit, it became something that has never departed, and that I never, ever want to have anything to do with anything that would cause it to depart. Now, I am not perfect by any means, but through the word of God, God discipled me. He discipled me. Mm-hmm. Because when you come from the kind of chaos and trauma I come from, yeah, trust issues for sure. So I started walking to the local church and I would listen and I would study and I would take notes, tons, pages and pages of notes, five subject notebooks of notes. I would go to Bible study. I would listen. I would be the one to ask a lot of questions. Um, but God was my discipler for the first part of my Christian journey through the word. It was simply belief. And the motive that I now know and can, distri- can describe, the motive of my time in the word and with God in prayer was to know him. And for those of you who are students of the word or who love it like I do, you know that was why Jesus came. He's very clear about this in John 17. This is eternal life that they would know you and the one whom you sent. To me, that was plain as day. That was as clear as a line of code. Mm-hmm. This is eternal life. Know you and the one whom you sent. It was perfectly logical. It made sense. And I believe. But my relationship with God just continued to grow based on those firm foundation, those cornerstones, I believe. And this is eternal life, loving and knowing God. It's as simple as that for me. Mm -hmm. How are you changing in your beliefs and thoughts about yourself? Well, I think I'm in a place now where I've just come to this acceptance of who I am. And these days, there's so much time and space dedicated to, as many names, the grind culture, the hustle culture, the elevate culture, the glow up culture. There's a lot of that here in the United States. I've traveled a lot and I've seen the contrast. This place in my journey, I have finally stepped away from all of that. And I'm just living life with God. It's a very simple thing. And it's fun. It's, I call it Sabbath living. I used to listen to a podcast, I still do sometimes, called Every Day a Saturday, about a man who successfully transitioned from the grind culture into podcasting. And now every day for him is a Saturday. His, his daughter used to tell him when she never saw him because he was working so much, she used to say, Daddy, I wish every day was Saturday because Saturday was when she got time with her daddy. So he started a podcast every day is a Saturday. So my life now is every day is a Sabbath day. And yeah. what that means is I'm doing life with God and the rhythm of the rhythms of God. That includes hours of um, 
productivity. It also includes hours of housekeeping. It includes hours of being a mom to my kiddo who's really wanting to, he's in a classic movie phase right now. So <laughs> just this, this rhythm of life that's like waves. I have a squirrel named uh, Carlton the second that I, I, I don't like to take care of things because I took care of so much when I was a child. Yeah. Um, so my idea of a pet is my squirrel who comes to visit me every morning because I feed him. And then I get to watch him eat because he's so adorable. He knows those peanuts are going to be there in the morning. So he comes and he enjoys and I get to see how cute he is. And then he runs away and handles his business somewhere else. <laughs> For me, my life with God and my identity, my personal identity, it's just that, that with God life, like my squirrel, I know God's going to provide every day, somehow, some way, something. But I trust it and I expect or anticipate he never, ever lets me down. That's quite a contrast because when you're going through the trauma recovery journey, you deal with all of these things, these vows, these promises. Think about the promise I made as a child, Gene, um, that hunger is bad. Think about how that affected me growing up. I had an eating disorder in my early 20s. A hunger is bad. A scarcity is bad. Poverty is bad. Want is bad. Need is bad. I had to heal from all of those vows that I made as a child to survive. And that's what most trauma survivors can understand. You have to do the work to go from surviving to actually thriving and living because survival is not life and it's definitely not abundant life. Mm -hmm. So I have and continue to do good work. I still have a trauma therapist. I also do um, body work continue to mitigate the effects and the echoes of my trauma it's still a part of my journey but I know that I'm doing life with a God who adores me and is never looking for perfection he's never looking for perfection but he's always desiring for us to be faithful he's looking for faith he's looking for faithfulness not perfection because he knows we can do one and not the other we can always do one never do the other perfection is his job right exactly exactly um, so let's kind of summarize where we are and, and move into the trauma recovery, because I know that's such an important aspect of your life and, and what you're currently working on. So we've made it to 11th grade. You uh, start reading the word, becoming uh, knowledgeable of Jesus Christ and building a relationship with him. You go off to college and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get your broadcasting degree you are working in radio at that time uh, concurrently with your college degree. And then you go to uh, the Moody Bible Institute, which to me is a very fascinating organization and you're doing radio for them. Then you're working on what a lot of people remember as a Jesus project, which was very uh, foundational and helping to reach out to the world about the Jesus you met uh, mm -hmm. in the Bible during your times of trauma and need. And, so all that's going on, your mother, and we'll just kind of set this and move on. Your mother passes in 2015. You start a sugar addiction at that time. You're a workaholic because that's the way you got rewarded as a child. If I go to school, I go to work, we get food, you know, this, that, you know, all that's going on. You're reading like crazy. You love design and co code. You got all this stuff mashing in your brain uh, together and having a great radio career, but you're fighting still that traumatic experience. You're fighting the addiction. You're fighting the workaholism that you've referred to, you know, with the Sabbath cycle, uh, which was very interesting. And then connect all that to this guy named B.J. Falk. <laughs> when you are tasked, when you're tasked as a child with keeping the water running and the lights on and helping put food in the house for your sibling, when you're tasked with those things as a child, um, it's just normal to work hard. And so that's what I did. But I did everything that I did, um, accomplished everything that I have accomplished with a completely broken heart. I mean, I woke up every morning brokenhearted for a long, long time, up until recent past. I would say up until uh, 20, up until 2017, 
I woke up every day with a broken heart. And Dr. Fogg, Dr. B.J. Fogg is one of the reasons that I was, I was able to transition from uh, doing life, doing life quite well, and quote unquote mm-hmm. successfully, um, in the eyes of man, quote unquote successfully. Um, and I shouldn't even say in the eyes of man, because I know God has always been proud of me and he's always been with me. Um, but Dr. B.J. Fogg, back in the 90s, he um, did the research and discovered uh, the formula for human behavior along the way. Um, he was the first person to ever teach and talk about persuasive being te- technology being persuasive. He's the founder of, he was the founder, is the founder of the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University. And that was at a time where nobody ever believed that per- technology could or would be persuasive. But you can, re- you can read his textbook. I have it here on my shelf here. Mm-hmm. Um, Choice of technology on my shelf. Yeah. It's the textbook. Um, time, once everybody finally realized that he was right, he transitioned from persuasive technology and renamed the design lab into behavior design lab. He's the founder of behavior design, which is a comprehensive system for thinking clearly about human behavior, all built on the formula for human behavior that he discovered, which I believe to be an equal MC squared equivalent. So even though I was doing full time ministry, hosting, live radio, I, um, I continued my hobby of tech and BJ's work. And mm-hmm. I just felt strongly led to start doing more with tech. And there was a day when I just knew the Lord was telling me, you should email BJ Fogg and tell him how much you appreciate his work. I said, I'm going to do that. So I did. I went on his website. I found his email address and I I emailed him and um, he wrote me back and set up a time to talk. And I'll never forget, I borrowed one of the study rooms at the library uh, so I could be completely isolated for my call with Dr. B.J. Fogg at Stanford University. Right. And um, he told me he would only be able to talk for 15 minutes that day. I timed it. We talked for 18 minutes. (laughs) <laughs> and I told him everything that I, I thought about his work and how much I appreciated it and what his research, I believe his research could be used for in the, the times we're living in. And he invited me to come and study directly with him. Wow. And of course I said, yes. <laughs> Who gets the chance to go and study with one of their favorite, all time favorite professors right. at Stanford University? And so that's what I did. And so I just continued my studies with Dr. Fogg. I became a member of the teaching team for the Behavior Design Lab for his. Um, and I thought, well, this is great. Behavior design is wonderful. If only I could, you know, teach this in the church because it is system for human behavior that work because God is systematic. I could see it all in the scriptures. So it is apparent why you're at this point in your life as you've gone through your experiences and shown the people who who have uh, poured into you and shown you worth. You're becoming aware of Christ and his love for you, your systems background, you know, the tiny habits, all the things we've talked about. And I have these two questions I really want to ask because they're so important for our audience. The first question is this. You say God is a systems guy. Explain that to me. I'll be glad to. Well, we see it all over the place. If you just take a look at nature, you see the systems of God. I have this little squirrel that I feed. His name is Carlton II. And he knows he shows up every morning because he knows there's going to be a little pile of treats for him there. And uh, that's my closest idea of a pet. But there's a system to it. You know, Carlton the squirrel knows that if he shows up at a certain place, he will receive some food. And then he just scurries away and goes about the rest of his squirrel day. We see this in nature. We see we plant a seed, we water the seed, we care for the seed and it produces a harvest. And one of my favorite ways to illustrate this is in the book of Romans. I always have my Bible here. But if you look at chapter one in Romans, it says, because what may be known of God is manifested. God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even his eternal power and Godhead. So we're without excuse. God is a systems guy. Behind everything that we call reality, this matter that we have, and behind everything we experience as physical reality is a system that God put in place. And the tiny little decisions, millions and billions of decisions of God manifest into our reality, our existence. If you look at Colossians 3, it says, in God, in him, Christ, all things hold together, our cells and our body systems. God is a systems guy. It's everywhere. And just as God is a systems guy and we are made in the image of God, the tiny little decisions that we make that accumulate into what we know to be our reality, the reality of our lives, it's mm -hmm. important to understand that tiny system of God that multiplies and accumulates incrementally manifest into the reality that we experience. And that's helpful because number one, the system for human behavior, the science of human behavior proves that it's all about the tiny that creates sustainable growth for good. It's all about the tiny, planting the seed, watering, caring for the seed. We have a saying in behavior design, um, my mentor, Dr. BJ Fogg, plant the, a good seed in the right soil and it will grow without coaxing. You know, that reminds me a lot of somebody else, my other mentor, <laughs> my heavenly father, Jesus. You know, it's because it's the system of God. And yeah. so if you think about that, the mindset of tiny, and you understand it's about the journey, the destination matters, you know, praise Jesus, heaven will be all about God and all this will be behind us. The destination matters, but faith is a journey and a destination. And it's the tiny little decisions that we make that make all the difference for good. So yeah, God's a systems guy. And how does that help people who are stuck in the aftermath of the trauma they experience with shame and guilt and lack of confidence and lack of worth to, to get beyond that to a place of healing? Well, first of all, it helps you to understand the mind of God and how we may be whatever number of years old in the journey right now, from five to, to 50 to 99, uh, God sees us as his children. We are his beloved children. And he is so proud of us with every tiny little step we take, every time we decide to believe uh, without faith, the scripture says in Hebrews, it's impossible to believe God. It's helpful because you can understand that God celebrates the tiny, just like we do with our, our babies in healthy, loving homes. We celebrate the tiny and that's how they learn to move forward and that the world is safe and that they are loved and valued. God is the same regardless of our age. The tiny little things that we do that we think are too small are actually monumentally huge in the eyes of God. He's so proud of us. So this mindset of tiny can lead to true breakthrough if you're very strategic and intentional with understanding that God is so proud of you. He loves you so much. What you've been through, your situations and your circumstances, they don't have to define you, define you and cast this huge shadow over your life because they can't tell you who they are. Only God can do that. I mentioned a little earlier that, you know, I'm not thankful for my trauma. One of the questions I'm asked often, Gene, is, you know, since now I've got this book out, people are asking, oh, do you think God used your trauma to lead you to your calling? And I always respond, absolutely no, because my trauma and my abusers did me no good. But God's love is what leads us to our assignments, because we all have the same calling to love the Lord with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to overflow that love, love your neighbor as yourself. We all have the same calling, but our assignments from God are for good. And you don't need that trauma to accomplish the assignment he has for you. He doesn't need to use evil to bring about good. So the mindset of tiny can keep you encouraged as you move forward. Important. Profound, profound. God helped you to overcome the evil that you experienced. And his love helped bring you to the place of, of your giftedness that he'd given you. So yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And that kind of leads you. I know that uh, Dr. Fogg's book, Tiny Habits, had a great influence on you with his teaching, which led you to your book, uh, where you take that another step and start applying it uh, to a relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. So tell us about what um, your transition from there to how you found a way to work in the church in the writing of the book. I was asked to speak in 2018, going on 2019, December 2018, I was asked to speak at the DuPage County prayer, prayer breakfast. And I did. And I, you know, was geeky as it always is and fun. And 
um, I remember getting such great feedback from that event. But a couple weeks after I spoke at that event, I um, just a few weeks later, I got an email from Nav Press and um, in affiliation with Tyndale House. Yeah. Um, acquisitions director, uh, Pape, he said, a little birdie told me to call you. And I've been to your website and I'll be in Chicago in February. Would you like to have lunch? I was like, sure. <laughs> I'm always up for adventure. Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <No>? <laughs> exactly. And so we had lunch at Chili's and I ate most of his food because I didn't like what I ordered. And um, at the end of our conversation, he said, so are you writing anything? I said, well, I've got this little thing that I did, this book, little four chapters that I wrote as I was grieving through, um, went through grief when my mom passed. And I, I used behavior design to help me with my grief strategy. And he said, well, I'd love to read that. And fast forward today, <laughs> result of that uh, lunch at Chili's was, um, is you are worth the work moving forward yeah. from trauma to faith. And it is a, um, it's a strategy. It's a little guidebook for creating your own comprehensive, but simple, simple strategy recovery that's perfect for you using the science of human behavior and behavior design. So far, I've heard great things and I'm thankful to be a part of this outreach, but I brought it all together. You have, you really have. Uh, <clears throat> you have survived your trauma and you have uh, healed from that experience. You um, have learn the goal of tiny habits and how that reflects the nature and characteristic of Jesus. And, you know, you and Jesus have been tight, you know, throughout the whole process. And you're really at a, at a beautiful point. And it's so encouraging to see what you and Christ have done together. It's just amazing. And, and I, uh, I know, and I know I you're would... kind of, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. The only thing I would um, love to add to, uh, first of all, thank you so much. You said you're healed with a D and I just want you to slow uh, back up because I'm on a healing journey. I mean, really as a species of humans, we are, that's the redemption story. We're on a healing journey. I'm still healing. I still have nightmares. I still have memories and things that break my heart. There are moments where I take a two minute tiny meditation break and I just cry and go to God with whatever triggered the pain again, yeah. because it's, it's always going to be there. And that's something, there are some things that we go through there. Some of us go through that you can never forget. They're, they're too terrible. Mm -hmm. Unless barring a miracle. And, you know, I still believe in miracles, but I'm on a healing journey and it's just, it's exciting now that God has invited me to invite others and that's a very important word to accept your healing journey and celebrate all the victories, but also be honest and compassionate with themselves because it takes time and it is work. And it could be, barring a miracle, an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that, you know? This mm -hmm. world is not as it would be or should be. Mm -hmm. and, and that is so true. I'm glad that you said that because, um, you know, you can't forget that level of trauma. And it's great that you say that because you will live with that the rest of your life, but you continue to live with it differently as your relationship yeah. with Christ moves forward. And mm -hmm. you know, there's always going to be that, you know, I hate triggers, but uh, you yeah. know, you, you're just going to get triggered uh, as you go through life. But those moments of, of, again, just of learning dependence on Christ and his love and his forgiveness and, and his strength, um, you know, it's encouraging in and of itself. And it's, it's a part of the growth process. So well said, well said. All right, here's a, here's a great question for you. Age nine, hey God, I need a receipt. This lock thing's not working out. So now, you know, you're, uh, you're north of 25. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what's your statement to God now? Oh, well, just thank you, daddy. Thank you, papa. Uh, thank you for believing in me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for valuing me. And um, just thank you for being the source of all that's good and right and true in this world. You are the best part of life. And I adore you. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> well said. Well said. Well, this has just been so encouraging. And so I'm just so thankful that you spent this time with us today. Thank yeah. you. It's been my honor, Jean. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate you so much. Yeah.
Thank you. You're so kind. Here's a summary of what I've learned today from Junie's thoughts. Number one, you can move beyond trauma. Number two, focus on today and tiny habits. Christ said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And then third, Christ loves you and his love is transforming. Thanks for listening. Peace.